On today's show, we take a guided walk through Plymouth's historic Leiden Street. Go on the local scene with author and activist Pamela McCall, learn about the meal planner and cookbook app, Tasty, chat with Father Christmas himself on Open Here, and talk about upcoming events and resources in our South Shore towns. I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. Let's get started. <music> What we now call Leiden Street in downtown Plymouth has been known in other times as First Street, Great Street, Broad Street, and simply The Street. We went on a walkthrough with Pilgrim Hall Museum Executive Director Dr. Donna Curtin to learn more about the oldest continuously occupied street in town. We're here at the gateway of some of Plymouth's earliest history at Leiden Street. This street has been known in the past as the Great Street or the First Street, and it was one of the earliest streets laid out in the community of Plymouth. Of course, we also have to recognize this area was earlier the village of Patuxet and the homelands of the Wampanoag people. There was a thriving community here before the pilgrims arrived, and this street may even have been an original pathway of the indigenous people before the arrival of the pilgrims in 1620. Leiden Street is intimately associated with the history of the Mayflower Pilgrims. Remember, they were exploring along the coast after sighting land at Cape Cod in November of 1620. They arrived here in Plymouth and determined this was the place in December and immediately decided they would apportion lots of land to the 19 family groups represented on the ship so that these families could start building shelter for themselves. They needed to protect themselves against the elements, and also many of the passengers had begun to fall sick. So providing a place for them to care and tend for one another was critical. One of the first shelters that they built was a common house. This was to be used for the common good of the colony. Those early shelters built here on Leiden Street were really essential to the survival of those that made it. Why did the pilgrims decide to settle here in Plymouth? Along their explorations, one of the important things they were looking for is good water, and they found that here aplenty. There was the Town Brook, a wonderful waterway that would offer them both fish and drinking water and multiple springs of water that the early settlers described as fair, sweet, and delicious. To them, it was almost as good as the beer that they would prefer to drink. Why was Leiden Street laid out here? Well, its proximity to their source of water was a help. But another feature of the street is that it is laid out on a steep incline. We are gonna go up the hill. And for the early settlers, that hill offered them another way to protect and defend the early settlement. They mounted their ordnance, their cannons on the top of the hill. And an early visitor to Plymouth described the street as being a cannon shot in length. Part of the topography of Leiden Street is the steep slope along its north and eastern corner, which is today known as Coles Hill. You see this beautiful empty grassy slope behind me. Well, Leiden Street was laid out and lived in by the Mayflower passengers, but their descendants continued to build on the street over time. So there were houses here in the late 17th, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And the character of the street changed during those later generations. At one point where I'm standing right now, there were many little buildings cut into the hillside. There were homes and shops, and one of them was a, actually a popular destination in the late 19th century for early tourists to Plymouth called the Old Curiosity Shop. People would come to meet its rather unique proprietor, Winslow Brewster Standish, an old local with Mayflower roots, and he would sell them souvenirs and antiques. 19th century, the Pilgrim Society, my organization that owns Pilgrim Hall Museum, had begun to acquire a lot of the property on Coles Hill because they wanted it to be a commemorative and memorial space to their ancestors, to the Mayflower history of the town. And so they began purchasing these buildings and eventually tore them down, demolished them in order to preserve the hillside itself. The brick end house behind me, the Joseph Tribble House, constructed about 1794, rests on the lots where some of those early 
pilgrim structures had been erected early in the colony's history. Their common house, for example, and their storehouse were once on this area, but those buildings did not survive over time. They were torn down and replaced by the buildings of later generations, including this lovely late 18th century home. We're here on the corner of Carver Street, which connects with Leiden Street right up ahead here. And also, there's an interesting feature that is rather distinctive to Plymouth from its colonial days, and that is an alleyway. We're here at the corner of LeBaron Alley. Behind me is the house that was built in 1832 by Captain James Bartlett. He was one of the first Plymouth mariners to invest in the whale fishery in Plymouth. He put together a vessel to go out on a three-year voyage to go after the whales, and they returned with thousands of barrels of very valuable and precious cargo, that whale oil. Religious motivations were important to some of the early colonists that settled Plymouth and laid out Leiden Street. But they actually had some difficulty finding a minister in the early years of the colony. And it really wasn't until the 18th century that Plymouth developed a stronger ministry. One of those important figures was the Reverend Chandler Robbins, who built the house behind me in 1778. He served as minister of Plymouth First Church for 40 straight years. So on Leiden Street, there's layer upon layer of history. We're at the site of where the spiritual leader of early Plymouth Colony, Elder Brewster's original Meerstead and garden plot was assigned and where his home was when he lived in Plymouth Colony. And over time, of course, that 17th century building did not survive and was replaced by a number of different structures. And in the early 20th century with the current building, our federal United States post office building made of brick on the corner. Now behind the post office building was another lot and that w had a home erected in 1703. It is now a vacant area. You can't see that building anymore, but it was erected by Plymouth's first French resident. This was a shipwrecked Frenchman Dr. Francis LeBaron, who shipwrecked off Cape Cod in 1694, but built a beautiful and stately mansion right here in Leiden Street in 1703. Sadly, that building did not survive. It was torn down, uh, replaced with a number of different structures, and is today a parking area behind the post office. Leiden Street leads up the hill into historic town square, featuring some of the church buildings of Plymouth, the inheritors of Plymouth's earlier churches, and also its earliest surviving colonial era courthouse, the 1749 courthouse, today a museum with all kinds of local artifacts in it. And behind us, you see even steeper and higher the incline of Burial Hill, which was originally called Fort Hill. That's where those cannons were placed to create the long cannon shot from the top of the hill all the way down out into the harbor that is the length of Leiden Street. Many visitors to Plymouth will walk along historic Leiden Street, following in the footsteps of all those generations that have come before, and their journey culminates here at Historic Burial Hill. This was used early in the colony's history as a graveyard for those early settlers, not the very first, but sometime soon in the colony's beginning, it, we know it was used that way, and for every generation since until the last interment occurred in the 1950s. And it wasn't until 1824 that we came to know it as Leiden Street. Why was the name changed at that time? It's because Plymouthians had started at the time of their bicentennial year in 1820 to take a greater interest in their own history and connect with it and find meaning in it. And at that point, they thought rather than a more generic name for this main thoroughfare and this historic roadway in Plymouth, that it should have something of historical significance in its name. And they named it Leiden Street to reflect the years that those early Mayflower settlers had spent in the Low Countries in exile before deciding to cross the ocean and come here to America. So Leiden Street, it's been known as ever since. And here at the end point of our tour up Leiden Street, we find at every pace and every step our connections to the generations that have come before us. This can be deeply meaningful for visitors to Plymouth who are searching for their lineage roots, but it's also meaningful to every single person 
who takes a step here in our historic downtown and realizes we are literally following in the footsteps of those that come before. What are their stories? What do we have to learn from them? Uh, these are the things that we continue to explore. To learn more about the rich cultural history of this area, visit pilgrimhall.org. Experience the musical magic of the holidays on December 15th at the PCIS Concert Band's Winter Concert, Sounds of the Season. Presented at the Plymouth North High School Performing Arts Center, this energetic program of Yuletide and wintertime favorites, these talented young performers will send you into the spirit of the season. The curtain goes up at 6 p.m. Visit the PCIS Music Facebook page for more details. If you're a member or ally of the senior LGBTQ community and would like to connect with others locally, the Duxbury Senior Center welcomes you to attend its LGBTQ holiday brunch on December 17th at 10 a.m. Tanya Neslusen from Mass Equality will be the keynote speaker for this event that is open to all. Visit the Duxbury Senior Center website to register. New Year's Eve celebrations can be a blast if you like staying up until midnight. If you like to be tucked in a little earlier but still enjoy end of year festivities, join the Pembroke Council on Aging for their New Year's Eve party on December 30th at, you guessed it, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. The center will be transformed into a New Year's Eve dance hall. Listen to live music from the Play It Again band and indulge in a delicious Chinese food buffet provided by Peking House as you ring in 2023 with friends. To reserve your spot, call 781-294-8220. Noisemakers and party hats are included. Since 1823, mothers and fathers have made reading Clement Clark Moore's Twas the Night Before Christmas to their little ones a Christmas Eve tradition. Author Pamela McCall has researched this iconic poem for her latest book, Twas the Night, the Art and History of the Classic Christmas Poem. We went on the local scene to learn more about Pamela, her work, and her history with this iconic holiday classic. I grew up with a lot of people who encouraged me to uh, use my creativity and to read. I was one of the people whose dolls had library cards. I had so many children's books. So I was blessed with a lot of great aunts and uncles who provided me with a lot of literature. So I have loved children's literature and the characters that come with it. So from Winnie the Pooh to Snoopy, I mean, they played a big part in my growing up. And I, I think Santa Claus is a big piece of that. I think that magical thinking and creative thinking and reading are such an important part of a child's education. It's magical thinking. It's the belief, right, that this jolly character with his reindeer is going to visit your home and give you something. And as I, you know, often tell people, there's no naughty or nice in this. It's inclusive. There's no birchen rod. There's no penalty. There's no creepy elf checking on your behavior and reporting back to anybody. This is benevolence, kindness, but it's magical thinking. It's you know, all the characters we can think of that instill hope in children um, of a promise of something to come that's good. It's not just that the poem's read. There's a day of the year <laughs> that celebrates the poem, right? I mean, Christmas Eve is this poem brought to life by billions of people, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> and so every Christmas Eve, this poem has its day and, and hopefully will for another 200 years or more. It's the spirit of Christmas for sure. And the Christmas dinner, creation of Christmas dinner, the way we do it now, I think you can credit to Dickens and Washington Irving. But I say that Clement Seymour gave us Christmas Eve and Santa and the reindeer. And, and, and it's such a huge part of so many people's Christmas. And we're here at the Mayflower mm -hmm. Society's uh, Research Library. Um, they're very gracious to have me here to speak about the, the book I've done um, and the connections to the Mayflower and the, the uh, pilgrims. And uh, it's just been, this whole project has been a wonderful thing to do. It's just a great piece of American history. You know, the staff have been great. Everybody's been just really receptive. And uh, I'm speaking at probably 20 museums in the next three weeks or four weeks in four states or five states. So it, it's just bringing history to people through a poem. 
I um, have a history background, so my education, I went to Queen's University in Kingston, just across the border, and I wanted to work in children's television or production. That was my goal as a teenager, but I turned my, my um, interest to art history and into the career of an art consultant. So I was a corporate art consultant for 25 years, so I bought art for hospitals and for governments and for private corporations. And so I left writing and I left children's production and all of those things. But then in my 50s, 10 years ago, I decided to get back into publishing and I published The Night Before Christmas. And I did it with a, a special feature to it. I took out The Smoking Santa. And it became a really big sensation around the world. And I'm not understating that. It went from Bombay to Brisbane that I had taken the smoking pipe away from Santa. And so I decided to write this book 10 years ago. I, I realized that the poem, Twas Night Before Christmas, turned 200 in Christmas on Christmas Eve of 2022. And so I started working on it 10 years ago. And, and it does celebrate its bicentennial this Christmas Eve. I started off wanting to write the history of the night before Christmas. And that involves Clement Seymour, who was born at the end of the American Revolution and dies at the end of the American Civil War. So it's a great period of history to look at. But what I realized was the connection to his ancestors and to the early days of Christmas in America, one had to go back. And so I went back, and so the book has, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe's story about the, the uh, first Christmas in America um, with the Pilgrims from the Mayflower. And it has, the other aspect of the whole history of this poem is St. Nicholas. And so I realized <laughs> that not only did I have to go back to the you know, 1700s, I had to go back to the Roman Empire. <laughs> because it's St. Nicholas who was the uh, inspiration for the storyline, which is this benevolent saint throwing gold balls through a window anonymously to save these daughters who are being sold into slavery because the father doesn't have a dowry. And so St. Nicholas comes to the rescue, but he wants to do it anonymously, and the father stays awake and figures out it's St. Nicholas and the legend builds, right? So that's the essence of the poem. It comes from St. Nicholas. And then you have to follow through all the centuries, you know, get yourself into England, mm -hmm. <laughs> the court of you know Elizabeth and James I, and then find your way across the oceans to America. So it, it's quite a, a big history piece. Um, and then, of course, because the poem is so visual um, in its language, and it's been illustrated thousands of times, that because of my art background, I had to go and research the art, not only of the illustrations, but of the artists who have been inspired by it. When you look at the history of the editions too, you come to the golden age of illustration, which is 1880 to 1920, and you, you know, come across the great Howard Ply, you come to Jessica Law Smith, W. Denslow, you know, some really major talented people. So, uh, quite the project. The one thing I want more than anything else is for this poem to continue because there was so much competition. I go into bookstores now, I was in six bookstores, six bookstores yesterday, and the competition's huge. There's an elf, there's a reindeer, there's an elf who can't find his way somewhere, there's all these things, right? And I would hate to see this um, fall down and not be given the credit it's due um, and not be read as much. And I, I've watched, I've seen the readings kind of falling off a little bit. So I'm hoping that the bicentennial which is this Christmas Eve of the reading and the writing um, brings people back to the core of it and to um, and, I, and I think this whole artistic legacy of the poem too I hope people can take an interest in this book that I've done because of these amazing talented artists who came to this poem I mean you know Denslow illustrated Wizard of Oz people know him for that but he did this as well it is absolutely the spirit of Christmas it's giving kindness inclusion um, and magical thinking and I think we need magical thinking we do. we do we need creative thought we need magical thinking and you know creativity it's just so important for children especially it's, it's just, inspiration it is it absolutely is inspirational and, and if you can't hope like it's hope, right? Mm -hmm. You hope he's going to show up, right? And he does, right? Dreams do come true. 
For more information on Pamela McCall and her book, visit twasthenightbook.com. A spirited snowball fight is a winter hallmark, but what if there's no snow on the ground? On December 27th, the frozen fun will be indoors at the Adams Center in Kingston with an epic and playful indoor snowball fight. Recommended for ages 6 to 11, this event will run from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. Registration is required. Visit the Kingston Public Library website to sign up. Take a break from your holiday shopping and baking and handmade gift making and head to the Plymouth Public Library on December 20th for a night of music with renowned pianist Sergei Novikov. Novikov began his musical studies on the three-stringed balalaika at the age of six and emigrated to the United States from his native Russia with dreams of a better life. Now, he has become a major presence in contemporary composition throughout the New England area. Join this talented musician at 7 p.m. as he performs a program of classical jazz and holiday music that will energize and delight your senses. This event is sponsored by the Plymouth Public Library Corporation and is free with no registration required. Being an advocate for your child can be challenging and intimidating. There's so much to know about where to go for resources. On December 13th at 6.30 p.m., join the virtual event it's okay to ask for help, an introduction to obtaining or managing services for your children, presented jointly by the Family Center at Community Connections of Brockton and the United Way of Greater Plymouth County. Through this free session, you will learn how to identify red flags, get information about services that are available, and educate yourself on how to be a better advocate for your child. This free event is open to all, but registration is required. For more information, visit the Family Center at Community Connections of Brockton Facebook page. This time of year is high season for cooking and baking, and TIFF adds to the merriment with an introduction to the meal planner and cookbook app called Tasty on this installation of Apps Untapped. What's going on here? I'm in charge of the Pack TV holiday party, and none of these recipes are giving me any inspiration, and it's all gonna be a failure, and it's all gonna be because of me. It's okay, just uh, give me your phone. Here. What's this? The Tasty app. This is amazing. Now go do your thing. You have an absolute tap to do. Hey, hey, it's your girl Tiff here with another episode of Apps Untapped. Now, seeing as it's the holidays, aka baking season, we thought we would bring you a little ease to your cookery. So, like Max said, we are going to let you know all about Tasty. Now, if that name seems familiar to you, it probably is. You've probably seen a million Tasty videos while traveling on your social media adventures. Tasty describes itself as a food network. No, no, not the food network, a food network. They have cooking videos, cookbooks, etc. They also have this free little app that I think you're gonna have a lot of fun with, so let's get to it. Sometimes you're super indecisive about what you wanna make and sometimes you just wanna browse. Tasty lets you discover a vast array of deliciousness from the comfort of your very own kitchen. And searching for your next holiday goodie has never been easier. All you have to do is go to discover and tap on the search bar. From there, you can either do a search of your own or choose from the fine list of options Tasty has to offer. Wait, what are coconut fig pops? I'm just gonna save that. Let's cover recipes because that's why we're here after all. Once you've found a recipe that you like, you're gonna find that the app is extremely user-friendly. In addition to getting instructions, you can watch a quick video of how the footage gets made, see pictures of what other people made, and get nutritional info, and read reviews, and find other recipes that are similar to what you're on. So, I actually like putting together a shopping list, but if you're not a weirdo like me, then you'll love this next feature. Tasty takes all of the guessing out of that pesky shopping list situation and makes it super quick and easy for you. Simply go to the recipe you choose, hit the three horizontal lines at the top, and then a lovely list will appear. From there, you can send it to a friend, to yourself, or to your spouse. So, you know, they know that you want brownies when you get home, hint, hint. Tasty also has guides. What are guides, you may ask? They're actually an archive of articles, some of them instructional, most of them hilarious. 
Here you'll find some cooking hacks, food experiments, and celebrity recipes. Not sure why I'd want to know Cher's favorite meatball recipe. Wait, yeah, I, I really want to know Cher's meatball recipe. Regardless, the articles are fun to read and are a good pick-me-up for a rough day. Five stars. Do recommend. Another cool thing you'll probably like is Tasty's cookbook feature. Very similar to Pinterest, Tasty allows you to create boards that you can add recipes to. Basically, it's a way to organize your favorites by category. And this type A personality is all about the organizing. Thank you, Tasty. Now that we got the run of a land, let me share some super helpful tips. Diet preferences. Now, I don't want my vegetarian friends to feel left out. If meat's not your thing, you can actually change your preferences so that you only see vegetarian recipes. Just go to your profile, tap on the gear sign at the top corner, and tap the vegetarian option. Now there's nothing for vegans yet, but you can do a search for vegan recipes and a few should appear. Watch the step-by-step -step video. Sometimes people aren't great with reading instructions. I totally get it. I'm more of a visual person myself but Tasty has got you covered. The app allows you the option of watching a video with each step. All you have to do is click on the recipe of your choice, scroll down to step-by-step -step mode, and slide through the instructions. How rad is that? Well, this has been a fun and culinary adventure for both of us, but before I... Okay, I give up. Why are you guys looking at me like that? We worked hard all year on your apps on tap, and you stole my muffin. I've spent so much time editing your silly little skits. You stole Ben's muffin. My muffin. And you put ketchup on my face. On his face! We demand restitution. Alright, do you guys want cookies? Heck yeah, we want cookies. Come on, I'll make you a fresh batch. I'll even let you lick the bowl. Woo! All right, I'm gonna go feed the work fam. Happy holidays from our crazy crew to yours. It's been great chatting with you. Be well. A great day starts with a great morning and great music can start a fantastic morning. On December 14th, head over to the Duxbury Senior Center for morning music with Steve Lenzalata. Steve is a longtime local pianist and will be playing your favorite melodies from show tunes, jazz, and the great American songbook. The show begins at 10.15 a.m. Visit DuxburySeniorCenter.org to learn more. Coco, cookies, and Christmas movies. If that speaks to you, join other holiday movie enthusiasts for Christmas movies, Coco, and cookies every Thursday at 1 p.m. at the Pembroke Council on Aging from now through December 22nd. For more information, call the COA at 781-294-8220. Do you want to be more physically active but dislike the winter cold? The walking program at the Kingston Collection may be for you. Ma Walking offers a safe, warm, comfortable, and free way to increase your health and make some friends while you're at it. The program begins at 6 a.m. each day. Visit kingstoncollection.com to download a walking map and find out more. An annual favorite, classical guitarist John Muratori will share holiday classics at the Duxbury Free Library on December 18th at 2 p.m. as part of their Sunday Arts and Culture series. John will feature musical selections from Noel, A Classical Guitar Christmas. Visit the library's website to register. The Americana Theatre Company would love to play a part in your Yuletide season activities via their high-spirited take on the beloved classic, A Christmas Carol. To set the scene of the show within a show production, it's opening night of a production of A Christmas Carol, produced by formerly married couple Charles and Isabella Richardson, and everything is going off script. Isabella desperately tries to hold the play together as Charles wreaks havoc on the whole production while portraying the role of Ebenezer Scrooge at his most angry, cruel, and bitter, both on stage and off. Will visitations from the three spirits of Christmas redeem his heart, save the production and his marriage? Take a seat and fall in love again with this holiday classic, the 10-person cast of players, and this poignant and wildly funny debut production, written by Derek Grant Martin and Jesse M. Sullivan. An Americana Christmas Carol will run from December 10th through the 18th at the gorgeous Plymouth Center for the Arts. Get your tickets at americanatheater.org. For our last guest of 2022, we made a list. We checked it twice. And we're happy that the 
father of Christmas himself was able to squeeze in some time away from his busy workshop. Here is Open Here, where Tiff's guest is the one and only Santa Claus. Santa, I am so excited to see you here today. I know you are a busy, busy man, so thank you for taking the time to be here. Ho, 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 any, anything for you, Tiff, and the Open Hair Podcast. I'm glad that I had a break in my schedule this season to come down and talk with you today. Ho, 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 ho. So what does a typical day look like for you? I tell you what, Tiffany, it's very busy up there at the North Pole. You would think I would be able to take a break, but no. Day after day, I wake up. The first thing I do, I feed the reindeer. And then after I feed all the reindeer, I go to the workshop and check on the progress and make sure that we've got everything lined up for the holiday season. Then after that, I go and feed the reindeer again. That's right. And then after that, I go and uh, consult my list. I double check it and triple check it because I want to make sure who's on the naughty side and who's on the nice side. After that, yes, I feed the reindeer again. And then I'll uh, have a nice dinner with uh, Mrs. Claus. And uh, as I prepare to go to bed for the night, I feed the reindeer again. That's right. The reindeer eat four times a day. They, uh, they need all that energy to be able to travel around the world delivering gifts to all the boys and girls around the world. Well, <laughs> well, I can see that because, I mean, they do a lot of work and that burns a lot of calories. So, of course, they'd have to eat four times a day. Totally understand that. Now, I have to say, we are a bit of a nerdy podcast here. We like movies. We like TV. Who is the best actor that has represented you in TV or movies? I must say, you know, uh, Ed Asner certainly did a good job in Elf, and then uh, Tim Allen does a fairly decent job portraying me as well. But I must say, the best performance that has the Santa Claus seal of approval would be the 1947 version of Miracle on 34th Street. That's right, Tiffany. Featuring Edmund Gwynn, he portrayed me excellent. I am very proud of his beard. I need to find out what type of beard oil he uses because I certainly need it today. Ho, 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 ho. How do you feel when you see like other, other people representing you in the community at malls or at places like that? You know, the, the people who are ringing the bells on the street. Do you feel flattered? Like, is that something that makes you feel good about yourself? It does when they do a good job. I don't want them to be bad Santas, though. I want them to be good Santas. But, you know, spreading the word of Santa Claus, the joy of Christmas, as long as they're doing the right thing, they have the Santa Claus seal of approval. <laughs> That's pretty vague. That's pretty vague. So you're a busy man. What, what do you do to unwind? I tell you what, Tiffany, one of my guilty pleasures watching cat videos on that YouTube. I tell you what, you would think with this massive mass of facial hair I have on my face, I wouldn't be allergic to cats, but go figure, I am. Aww. So all I can do is live vicariously through those wacky felines on that YouTube. And then of course, I always like, a, I've got a classic sleigh tip, a classic sleigh. It's a Kringle 500. And I always like to do a little tweaking. I don't use it on Christmas night anymore, but I still love to tinker because every once in a while, I, you know, I might take it for a spin around the North Pole. <laughs> you mean you slay all day? Oh, Tiff! Oh, Tiff! I'm here for you. I'm here for you. <laughs> so I got to ask, what's your favorite part of this magical season? I must say, Tiff, I love cookies, and that time of year, this time of year, that's the best time for me to have some cookies, even though Mrs. Claus, she doesn't like me having all these carbs, but I had, that's my cheat day, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, that's my cheat day, to have some carbs. And then uh, also, Mrs. Claus makes a very, very nice fried turkey. I know I'll have that waiting for me after I've done my rounds from around the world. I can come home to some crispy fried turkey and uh, be able to take my boots off, let them soak in a nice foot bath because I've been traveling on all those rooftops, Tiff. 
Some of those rooftops are very bumpy, and it's very hard, very hard on, uh, you know, Santa Claus's feet. So, uh, so yes, fried turkey, cookies, and a nice foot bath. <laughs> that sounds lovely, like a Santa spa. I love it. I love it. Are you living your dream, Santa? Tiff, of course, of course, I'm living my dream. Spreading joy to all the children around the world, to the young and the young at heart, that, that gives me such joy and allows me to, uh, to live my dream. I gotta say, I've always believed in you and I still do. Do you think there's a reason why adults stop believing? Imagine, Tiff, imagine. Adults nowadays, they are drowning, drowning in notifications and Zoom meetings, staring at their smartphones and devices. It's just a lot of information. And sometimes you lose, you lose that feeling of believing because you have so many pressures. Oh, I have to rush out, buy all the food. Oh, I have to rush out, buy all the presents. That's my hope is that at the very least, just put down your devices and then you'll have a chance to enjoy the season and start dreaming and believing in Santa Claus again. <laughs> well, they better start believing because you're real, you're here. Um, what is the meaning of Christmas? Tiffany, there's various uh, meanings about Christmas, but here, here's my favorite. And this is from a quote from a magazine called The American way back in the year 1889. I had a uh, subscription to that magazine, so I know it well, I keep it framed right above the, uh, the mantle. The quote off of that magazine was this, to give up one's very self, to think only of others, how to bring the greatest happiness to others, that is the true meaning of Christmas the true meaning of Christmas. And, you know, with all of the hustle and bustle, you can kind of dissect that, but, but think about it. That's what we do. We go out and we want to make people happy. You know, all I want from Mrs. Claus every year is just a pair of socks because I love just going out and giving gifts to all of the children from around the world, to the young and the young at heart, just to make them happy. It's that gift of giving, Tiff, that gift of giving. Ah, oh, that meant that warmed me up inside. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me if I was on the good list or the bad list this year? Tiff, you're at the very top of my good list oh, this yay. year. The very tip top. <laughs> what do people have to do to get on the naughty list? I mean, there must be a, a criteria of some sort. There, I mean, you know, you go and invade a foreign country, that puts you right on the naughty <laughs> list fair. immediately. Or, you know, not, uh, not being giving, being selfish, self-consumed, but, uh, but certainly, you know, being your best self, giving to others, that gets you onto my good list each and every time. Well, I don't want to keep you for much longer because I know you have a lot to do, but do you think we can show out, we can close out the show together? Oh, of course, Tiff. If anything, anything for you. <laughs> all right. All right. One, two, three. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas to all, all and to, to all, all a good, good night. night. Merry Christmas, everybody. And that's what's good and good to know this week in our community. If you'd like to see more content from the local scene, follow us on YouTube and social media at The Local Scene. This show will be on hiatus for the next few weeks, but we will meet you right back here in 2023. From all of us at PAC TV, we wish you a joyful season and a happy new year. I'm Elizabeth. Thank you for watching.
Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to the local scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.